Good evening, and welcome to StarCast. From Planet Waves, I'm Eric Francis Coppolino, as usual, here with an astrological update. I'm doing this one in audio. We're gradually making the transition of StarCast into video, but I just like having a microphone in front of me and not staring into a camera. Saves me all the trouble of hair, wardrobe, makeup, and all that. All right, so um, I'm here with a, a look at uh, at today's astrology going into the weekend. But first, I want a little little I want a little say about what I'm doing. Uh, kind of all day, every day, or most of the day, almost every day, um, which is I am wrapping up the written readings called Somewhere in Between. Uh, no joke, this is professional level astrology for a tiny, tiny little fraction of the price. Uh, for a mere $133, you can hear me tell you about the astrology of every sign for an hour each in video. We're moving that to video format plus uh, essays that are coming in at about uh, 5,600 words per sign. No repeating. No boilerplates, no copy and paste. I'm not even reading uh, last year's reading. I'm starting fresh from scratch. Every year I do this, and every year it seems like I'm relearning astrology over and over again. But what is different about 2024 is that Pluto is changing signs for good, for real, for the next 20 years in a two-stage uh, transition on January 20th and then November 19th, and we are in the Pluto in Aquarius era as of January 20th. That little dip back in in September is uh, it is just for uh, cleanup work. It's just kind of checking back through, making sure the lights are turned off on Pluto and Capricorn. Additionally, uh, we are going to have, the, we are entering the peak, the very peak of Chiron in Aquarius, uh, this has been brewing for six years. Chiron is like that. There will be a total solar eclipse conjunct Chiron to the arc minute on the 8th of April, 2024. This is absolutely over the top, unbelievable, outrageous that there could be an eclipse to the arc minute conjunct a centaur planet. This has never happened that I could fathom. It's it's in almost impossible to get three points to line up when you consider all the mathematics of it. Uh, and then this eclipse will go clear across the Americas uh, from southeastern Canada to, the, to, to basically the southern Midwest, right across through New York to Texas. Uh, it's incredible. And this is conjunct Chiron. This is both of these things in, in this Chiron, on this Aries Aquarius interplay that I've been documenting for years. These two signs are working together as one thing in the public realm. The Aquarius side is talking about the, the collective, and the Aries side is talking about the individual, but it is the same thing. They are just one coin flipping in the air, and whatever side it lands on on any given day is most of what you get. So the year begins with an, an Aquarius event, and then it continues with an Aries event, this is a massive wake-up call to stand apart, to be yourself. Both of these transits say, be yourself. Pluto and Aquarius is saying, stand out from the group. This, this whole, I believe what he believes stuff, I'll, I, I'll do what she does thing, it's got us in a lot of trouble in 2020 and 2021. A lot of people in the ground because they did something that someone else did uh, or did something that a celebrity said to do. Uh, a lot of us lost chunks of business, friendships, relationships, uh, and lived through 4.4 uh, billion people being locked in their houses because not enough people could break consensus. Pluto going into Aquarius is about breaking consensus. Uh, Pluto does not take any shit. And th this will have effects one way or the other. This eclipse conjunct Chiron only about what we have since late January, February, March, basically two and a half months later, uh, is is on the same level, though it's a one time event, not a 20 year event. And it is uh, the focus, though, of this nine year transit of Chiron in, in Aries. And that is not over. This begins 
a period of sustained Chiron events in Aries. Uh, and then more Aries coming in 2025 as uh, Saturn and Neptune line up on the Aries point. Aries is about the sense of self. And in verb form, it is about self-actualization, not a popular activity in the 21st century when most people have very little sense of their inner being. But don't worry, it's coming one way or the other. This is followed by the conjunction of Jupiter and Uranus in Taurus uh, on the 20th of April. This is unbelievable astrology. It is one thing after the next, clear through July. Then Jupiter and Sedna enter Gemini together. This is unbelievable. Ju Sedna's been in, uh, in Taurus since 1966. It's going to be in Gemini until 2066. We've never experienced a sign change of, of Sedna. The last time Sedna was in this position was when the glaciers were retreating. It has an 11,400-year orbit around our sun. This is what I've been working on interpreting. Each of these things, 12 different ways. Jupiter conjunct Sedna. Finally, Saturn conjunct Nessus in Pisces. A big watershed for all of this victim chic that we've been living with, this endless claiming of, making of, uh, extolling, ex worshiping, genuflecting to victim ideology. This is going to get a big chill as Saturn moves up on Nessus. We are entering a whole new phase of reality. We're about to be in a whole other slice of the orange, and that is what I am writing about in Somewhere in Between writing about these sometimes in sections of the of the reading that go on for seven or eight hundred words. Each one of these is a miniature astrology book tailored to your sun sign and rising sign. This is like no other reading you've ever had and nothing you've ever read in any other old book where all of that context is missing. The context of sign and house together and the context of now. So that's what I've been doing. Uh, I anticipate having this to you miraculously, Jesus and Mary miracle. The written should be in your hands on time Monday night. I could not pull together the audio, which we've changed to video in that time. So once we file this and get this delivered to you on Monday night, I am going to stop for a couple of days, probably go down to the city and do a couple of things and take the backstage tour of Madison Square Garden and fuck around and take pictures and then come back upstate and do your video reading. So uh, I trust you will uh, appreciate the fact that I am uh, taking no chances with these readings except being bold, but I am being meticulous, and these are going through three layers of proofreading process. I haven't gotten a single unfinished sentence sent back to me, which means I am <laughs> I'm awake at the switch. All right, let's, let's consider the current astrology right now as it stands. Um, as of, uh, let's see, I'm recording at 1244 in the afternoon. I can't believe it's not late, but it is 1244 in the afternoon on Thursday. Uh, today is the 4th. Uh, as uh, uh, regarding the chart I cast today, we are at last quarter moon. That's in a few hours. So when you hear this, we'll be just past last quarter. Uh, the moon's making its way through a cardinal sign. Uh, the run will include, let's see what else is here. Uh, well, the moon's going to be sextile Mercury today. That's nice. And then the moon's run through, uh, through Libra is going to end tomorrow overnight basically Thursday to Friday with an opposition to Eris and a square to Pluto. So that's kind of a crescendo type of ending. But if you're feeling a little forlorn or a little like under pressure, just sweat it out. Just just chill out. Uh, we're, it's a whole new world tomorrow. Uh, but the, that whole new world is the moon on Friday uh, entering Scorpio. So that's uh, that's pretty deep. But fortunately, the uh, it's going to be picking up all that stuff in, in Capricorn and all that stuff in Libra in a sorry in Pisces. Similar idea in in a um, smoother way, vibing with the water signs. The feminine signs are very active right now. There's a lot in Capricorn. There's a lot in Pisces. 
Okay, so uh, that that basically gets us into the weekend. Uh, let's see when the moon is going to change signs into Sagittarius. Hold on a second. Where's my Sprite program? I'm like the last person in the world who uses IO Sprite. Uh, and what I'm looking for is position the moon enters Sag. And that is going to be on the 7th. The 7th is... Sunday, so moon enters Sagittarius, <clears throat> Sunday, 4.08 p.m. So the moon's in Scorpio all weekend, Eastern Standard Time, can only get one time zone here, until 4.08 p.m. on Sunday when the moon enters Sagittarius. And that's a whole other experience, too. This Libra Scorpio Sag thing is very interesting because you can see and feel the colors changing. It's so different to have the moon in one or the other of those signs. Uh, and then uh, the moon moves on into Capricorn. And then on the 11th, we experience the uh, the new moon in Capricorn. This is the moon wobble, new moon. This is the sun square, the lunar nodes, exactly. That's on the 11th uh, of, uh, of January. It is uh, an eclipse-like event because the moon and the sun aspect the lunar nodes. So we are building to that. We're always building to the next lunation. The, the, the coming major lunation tells us what the time now is a little bit about, where we are headed, where, where, we, are, uh, where we are going. One last point. Uh, overnight tonight, uh, Mars entered Capricorn. Uh, Mars entering Capricorn means that Mars is going to make aspects to everything on the Cardinal Cross. Uh, I'm, I personally pay a bit more attention to the 90 degree type aspects conjunction uh, square opposition semi square or octile and sesquiquadrate that's three semi squares yes i'm i'm interested in uh, in the in trines but the trines are more exit ramps opportunities and and these all those other aspects on the 90 degree dial basically are more action oriented something happens but uh before mars does most of its stuff in on the cardinal cross it's making a sextile to saturn in effect now saturn in in pisces so it's going to be saturn sextile pisces all week that's good for leverage that's good for feeling like you can apply your energy in a focused way and get something done. Uh, Mars and Capricorn is great for doing that generally, and the support from Saturn is wonderful. The most interesting thing, I think, going on early in Mars's run through Capricorn is going to be the contact that it makes by conjunction with a group of planets currently in early Capricorn. Let's get that up on the screen. I can't show you. It's too many charts, but um, we're looking when Mars is conjunct Pholus. So this too is another thing that has the quality of what we are building toward. And that basically goes on uh, for about the next 10 days. So what's going on in early Capricorn? And, and this is something I've been asking for your input on because it's a, it is a very new thing. And it's also a very interesting and a very different kind of a thing. But after all this Pluto and Capricorn has you know, moved moved along, which is going to happen real soon, we're left with uh, a, a, an ongoing long-term event, mostly involving minor planets in Capricorn. They are Ixion, Pholus, uh, Quayar, Quaoar, Quayar. I don't know how to say that. Anybody speak Tungva? And then Apollon, a, no, no, Cupido. Sorry, that's a trans-Neptunian trans point, hypothetical planet without a body. I watch those carefully. Uh, and then Mars is going to move through this cluster in early Capricorn. This will help us get a sense of what this cluster in early Capricorn is about. It builds to a peak on January 15th uh, with Mars conjunct Centaur Pholus, the second of the Centaur planets. Now, I realize there's a lot going on, and it's difficult with so much going on to pick out one little tune amidst all of that, but... What I'm looking for on this is communication from the ancestors. What is coming in from the distant past? We need the wisdom of the ancestors right now. These are the people who know more than us. They are ascended masters. They have learned their life lessons. There are some very high beings among 
the ancestors and your ancestors. And so my question for you is, and please, if you're on Substack, add this to the comments, reply to the email, write to us what is coming through from your ancestors. What relatives, departed relatives, are you thinking about? That whole cluster has an ancestral feeling. And one of the underlying themes is learning the lessons of right and wrong. That's about Ixion, one of the points in this grouping. Again, it's Ixion, Quaor, Pholus, and Cupido, which Mars is working on, leaning into, activating. And there's a, there's a safety net with this, which is Jupiter trines the whole thing. So whatever it is, it's not that bad if Jupiter is making a trine and kind of holding the whole thing stable. Saturn's there too, holding it stable. So my question for you is, please write to me in some way, shape, or form, EFC at planetwaves.net or any other method, what information are you getting from the distant past? What are your thoughts about your ancestors, the people that you loved, some of whom you may not have known, the people who put us here? If you go back only 10 and a half generations, you have enough ancestors to fill Madison Square Garden. And I'm hoping to take that behind the scenes tour next week uh, and see the dressing rooms uh, in between doing the written and the uh, the video portions uh, of, of this uh, somewhere in between reading. Thank you for listening. Click on that. Get, get that. Get that while the getting's good. You're going to want this information now. Um, it'll still be good in 10 years, but it'll be better now. Thank you for listening. Thanks for being a Planet Waves customer or subscriber. Lots of love and... Bye for now.